Okay. All right, let's call the meeting to order then. Um, has everyone had a chance to take a look at the agenda? Any adjustments to the agenda? Are we going to deal with the plan at some point? And uh, the The Esri Hub uh, grant from Stone. Mm -hmm. uh, I was curious what's going on with that. I don't know if we want to add that maybe as yep. well, why agenda don't we item at the end. Or? Well, why don't we um, just get some updates from that under, um, I'll ask about that in my comments in the chair to the Stone grant and plan. Anything else? I think we can get updates about it without needing to warn that. Okay, hearing none, the agenda is approved. So comments for the chair. Uh, we haven't met in a little while because we had poor weather and I was away at the last meeting, so I want to officially welcome Aaron, our newest commissioner. Thank you. And you had a meeting without me, I believe, right? Yeah. yeah. He survived. So <laughs> you met everyone. Um, <laughs> And I just want to take a moment to recognize Kim Cheney for all of the work that he's done. Uh, he was a commissioner for a long time, and he really was critical, played a critical role in helping us get the zoning amendments, um, the package moved on to city council and ultimately approved. So just want to take a moment to recognize Kim. And um, th those are really my comments. Uh, we wanted to ask for some updates on a couple of items. So first, let's ask about the stone grant. Okay. I think that's a little bit more discreet, and then we can ask about the, you know, kind of the thoughts about the new city plan. So I met, we did get awarded the stone environmental ESRI grant. So that's an ARC GIS hub, which is going to be kind of a, a one-way, two-way communication tool that the city can use for a number of projects. Um, we already um, have a GIS person in public works, and Zach does a lot of work with it, but he just didn't have the background to teach himself all this stuff. So. Um, the advantage we have is that he's going to be learning a lot of how this ArcGIS hub works so he could be able to, it won't be a one-off thing where we do one thing and then it gets put on a shelf somewhere. He actually wants to learn how it works so he can keep doing these going forward. The first one they're going to be doing is actually going to be a transportation project. So they're actually doing uh, something with the snow plowing and and tracking the tracking snow plows. tracking the snow plows and people can get input on the s parking bans and um, just a number of, of pieces along that they also wanted to go and try to do some stuff on the pavement index but they kind of put that off to the side so the first idea was to kind of look at the parking um, and then that will let Zach work with the folks at Stone to learn how to replicate this and roll this out. So, um, and then we will be able to um, use Zach's skills to help us as we start rolling out with the master plan update or the city plan update so we can um, do some of our outreach. And the idea is with these GIS hubs is it's an interactive way that you can push stuff out to the public and get feedback back from them. You can do storyboards where you can try to tell a story. So GIS has been so much about data, 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 and maps that it, this was a way for them to try to con contextualize data so it can actually help the public and help policymakers make decisions. And that's kind of the, they're trying to take data to the next level and help um, be able to push it out and then let the public comment or ask questions back and um, that's kind of the goal of the overall process. And what's the timeline? I missed it. They, they told us they wanted to have the first one done by the end of the year. Um, Stone Environmental works directly with Esri. They're actually like a beta tester for Esri products so they work and 
do a lot of stuff. So they've been wanting to do this for a while, and it kind of got delayed, and now they finally are in a position to get it, and they want to try to get the first one done by the end of the year. But I'm, but they're going to continue to be available going forward with Zach to continue to do more of these and to continue to um, develop and ask questions, answer questions. So, But the first one should be coming out hopefully in the next month or so. Dare I ask, is, do, is there any thought that this training will help Zach help us with calculations of slopes and <laughs> no, it won't won't be able to do that. Okay. No, and we actually had a, a conversation about that. And they they made the comment that it's very it is it's just extremely large data sets that just can't. Okay. Well, be we can get more into that later. I was yeah. just wondering if that was in the scope of that grant. No, no, not in that grant. But as we start coming up with our plan elements, housing or transportation or something, we can start to build a storyboard about housing that then lays out maybe some of the statistics and the stories and, and the background of what the goals and aspirations are and, you know, let the data support that, that story and get that out and get, start to get public feedback on, on issues. Yeah, that's, I mean, we have sort of lost our momentum with the city plan, but I don't think it would be too hard to pick it up again um, with all of that input we received at, an, at a kickoff meeting. I don't know, Aaron, how much you've been told about this, but we had this, this meeting a, a few months ago where we invited a representative from various committees in Montpelier to present the top three goals their committee has over the next five to ten years with a view towards using that information in developing our city, our next city plan. And the first thing it could help us is to identify if there are overlapping goals or goals that potentially conflict so we can figure out ways to deal with that from the start <laughs> rather than finding them after everything's been written up and we feel a little locked in. So um, what we, we had a great meeting at the Pavilion Building Auditorium and we received a lot of helpful PowerPoints and just had a good discussion. But um, we haven't really done too much with that information yet. We, you know, Mike typed it up. Well, Barb took notes there, and then Mike typed it all up. So we have it in a digital form, mm. which is good. Um, and we had talked a little bit about creating a, a website or some sort of repository for all this information that people could work within um, and the public would have access to view. And uh, John started putting that together. But we just haven't moved forward with this too much, so we should revisit it and make a plan for where we're going. I think everything's just gotten kind of sidetracked with all of the zoning updates that we're trying to get through because they feel like they're a little bit time sensitive. And, and we had some discussion at the last meeting that we were going to try to get through the zoning in the next meeting or two so that way we could resume or resume that anything. um but then we kind of missed another meeting i mean it's since june we usually meet twice a month and june was the last month that we met twice so we met once yeah. in july once in august once in september once october once november and so it's that really starts to weather, yeah. yeah holidays weather vacations yeah. um just it's set us back a little bit so all right well how do how do people feel about that plan to get through the zoning changes and then resume the city plan you feel okay about that um yeah i guess i want to i'm curious about hub and whether or not what we've done with if that will be the sort of vehicle or tool for uh where we put the plan as opposed to the its own website um and, um, and yeah, I've started putting stuff in there. Barb and I met. I've taken what the Energy Committee sent and put it into a format that I think uh, is more workable that we can start looking at in terms of giving guidance to the committees and some uh, to try to promote kind of consistent uh, input that's um, 
that's useful for uh, for the plan. So there's when, whenever we're ready, I guess there's did you pick, some stuff. Did you pick any to, tags? Um, I don't think I in included tags at this point. I don't think we're we're there yet, but um, more kind of creating the baskets by which people can uh, characterize their input. Is it, is it a, a goal or a measurable objective or an action or a policy? What does that mean and what do those look like? And essentially took what something that the Energy Committee had written up and tried to did my best at putting it in those baskets. So anyhow, we can, I guess, follow up with that. I can also maybe chat with yep. folks at Stone or with, with you and Zach if you want to. Yeah, because I'm, I'm still waiting a little bit. I'm way behind the learning curve. I, I met once with Stone and looked at a lot of the stuff that was online for the hubs to kind of get an idea of what it is. But I'm still waiting to kind of see this first one start to come together to kind of see the process of how it's going to work what what information what do they need from from me from us to start that process for for the city plan mm -hmm. um, and I'm, so I'm kind of hoping to see where that goes but the the second meeting so the first meeting was um, end of October and then I think the last meeting was um, when I was at the housing housing meeting statewide housing meeting so I missed the second meeting so I have to get caught up on where they're at okay do you want to share John what you've done with the sure group? you all have access to it and uh, oh, okay. uh, Aaron I may not have added you yet to the, yeah, I don't to the drive but I'll, uh, I'll do that soon. okay I'll do that right now actually um, and then we can all just kind of take a look at it and provide feedback at the next meeting questions are probably more likely <laughs> uh, so the the last piece I will add on the plan is I have a meeting Wednesday this Wednesday two days from now I'm meeting with City Council and they on their agenda a while ago they had set that by the end of the year in December they wanted to um, have a meeting to kind of talk about the status of where the city plan is mm -hmm. and where the zoning fixes are. So depending on where we get tonight, um, particularly with the zoning fixes, I will be meeting with them on Wednesday to kind of either either to hand a piece off to them or to let them know here's the status that we're at and we expect to get to get things to you pretty quick. Yeah, and we have a few zoning um, changes that are more urgent than others so if we can wrap those up tonight that would be ideal so that we can hand off a small package to city council okay anything else with general did, did you do did did everybody introduce themselves and give information on how long they've been on the commission and no but you don't have to <laughs> if, you don't, uh, if you don't want to. Well, uh, okay. Was, we did, too we did some. Yeah, no, that we, was a completely like lacking format. No, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that at all. Right. I am. No, we, we didn't do the full like share one thing about yourself. Well, I don't think. Two truths and a lie. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, we should just quickly do that. I I think that we should just say, obviously, your name is in front of you, and Aaron already has a nameplate, which is great. Um, and how long you've been on the commission and what your background knowledge is in more specifically so I don't want to call it expertise or whatever whatever you want to call it but I think yeah and then for fun what district do you live in <laughs> whether you want to say one two three or a zoning district you know it's your choice but um, I'll start since I made this <laughs> requirement. So I'm, I'm Leslie. I've been on the commission since um, August 2014, I think. It was right after you started. So that, that would be year. 2014. 2014. Yeah. And I've been chair for a year and a half, almost two, almost two years now. And... Um, 
I I know a little bit about environmental law, but more like water quality law than land use. And I don't use any of those skills in the, <laughs> these no. meetings. I'm more of a policy person. Um, and uh, let's see, I live in District 3, which is, I think I'm the only member of the commission that lives in District 3. And I, what is my zoning district? It is. Oh, the Queensland? Mm. Oh. You're quizzing people now. I know, I know. I think it's. I would um, bet you're residential 3,000. No, I, or I think it's. Might six. be Riverfront. No, it's, it's the Prospect oh. Street. Yeah, I know, Prospect Street. Where is it? Mm. I don't think people know. are going to be able to figure it out. It's high density, I can tell you that. <laughs> and there are steep slopes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um,. It's kind of, I should know this. Do you have a map? Ah, I do have a map. Yeah. Mine just, it might just be Prospect Street neighborhood. Prospect Street is yellow, which is residential 3000. Oh, residential 3000. You win. Well, you are the, you are the planning. <laughs> I right did make a map. I get, I get extra okay. yeah. credit for. So the character of the neighborhood there is um, hillside buildings, I would say. Yeah. So anyway, John? Uh, so I joined the same time as you did, so 2014. Um, I'm a recovering planner and current map nerd. You were a map nerd before, too. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> now we just get paid for now being a map nerd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and where? What zone? Uh, zone uh, Ward 1, mixed use. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and Mike, you've been on since earlier in 2014. Earlier in 2014, I'm the staff um, for the commission, so I'm the only one not a commission member. Um, and my background is in uh, actually natural resource planning. And originally, I worked in science and ecology and then transferred into planning. And so certified I've been doing this manager. certified floodplain manager, certified planner. I've been doing this for 18 years now. So. And you came from, and you were working in Barrie. I was working in Barrie for five years before they're here, and then a bunch of regional planning commissions before that. So. I think I was appointed in February. Is that, is that something <laughs> that to you? Right. Yeah. Um, so, one of the newer before you. Um, I'm, I'm a planner, so I work for the state doing um, hazard mitigation planning, but mostly flood prevention, future flood prevention uh, planning work. And I'm in District 2, but I don't know which, so <laughs> on Charles Street on a very steep slope. Oh, Charles Street. Okay. But built in 19 Yeah, Charles Street. Charles Street is off of Ferry Street. Yeah. Yep. Just trying to. Visualize exactly. It goes up to Ridge. Yeah, it's in like the third down from the top. Yeah, that's another one. Same, same district. Residential, Residential three thousand. Yeah. Yep. I feel like it's a good sign when your planning commissioners don't know what zone they're in. I because, was thinking that too. Because it, it, um, they're not here for, like for their own <laughs> interest. Yeah. They have no, that's how no I was uh, characterizing my ignorance as well. <laughs> well like, I came post-map, so I thought it was... It changed so many it's times. It changed so many yeah. times. Who knows where we are now? All right, Barb, your turn. Oh, um, I'm Barbara. I'm, uh, I was a licensed architect for 30 years and taught at Vermont Technical College in sustainable design. And um, I'm also on the Energy Committee, so that's why John and I were working together on that uh, piece of the city plan. And I am in District 2, and I am in the Liberty Street slash College Hill uh, neighborhood, which is Res 6000. And I do know that because I've been looking at it for right. a little bit. Yeah, unfortunately, you guys may have had to look at it too um, because that was one of our examples. Um, and um, Mike, oh, I've been on the bank. You were in 15? 
been that sounds right. I was in sixteen. Oh, I was in twenty fourteen. You were twenty fifteen. Fourteen. I was in fifteen. Yeah. yeah. There's North Street, aren't you? Uh, well, this area? I'm Kirby. Uh, <laughs> I think I've been on the planning commission since 2016. Seems right. Uh, I live on Elm Street. Resident I'm pretty sure I'm zoned downtown, yeah, like one of the downtown categories. So um, I'm very urban. Um, and my background is in law, as as you know. So, so Kirby, Aaron, and I all went to law yeah. school together. Oh. We talked about that. We talked about okay. that last time. Okay. Yeah. Um, same class, which is like funny. Uh, I had an interest in law school and land use and stuff, but um, ended up falling into tax policy. That's my background. And like Leslie, I don't really use tax in this commission, but that's it. it oh, yeah, and you said urban, downtown. Mm -hmm. Urban Center 3. <laughs> Good thing you didn't hear Mike. <laughs> That's why he's here. <laughs> uh, hi, so I'm Aaron, and uh, like Kirby and Leslie, I'm an attorney, I work for the state, um, and uh, sort of I was drawn here because a couple of jobs ago I worked for the Department of Public Service. And part of uh, what I did there was I scoured a handful of uh, town plans. I uh, found it to be pretty interesting, so I kind of piqued my interest in this kind of work. Um, uh, I am in District 1. Don't know my zoning. Um, He's up on the, in the Terrace street? street neighborhood. Oh, Park Drive. Oh. We'll look it up right now. Yeah, I, I'm not going to move, but, you know, I'm there. We'll represent you. Yeah, yeah. Res 9. Res 9. Okay. Yeah. Did you say you do? You scoured what lands? Town plans. Oh, town plans. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. In various <laughs> lands, just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> took out fields. Yeah. No, I I did a, some deep dives on some town plans. And what, where do you work at the state now? Uh, I, that's a good question. I just gave my notice at my current employer on Wednesday. And I'm starting a new job in two weeks. I'll be working for the Secretary of State. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> didn't know if you didn't want to divulge that. No, no, yeah, it did, no, it's fine. Oh. I, was, everybody, I, was, I was thinking about that. I was like, who knows at my work right now? Yeah, right. But You've been knows. holding things so close to the chest for so long, it's hard to yeah, yeah, no, can go it, public. Yeah, it's just public now, I know, so, yeah. Well, congrats. And I, went, and I mm. currently at DFR, at financial regulator. So. I'm Ari Sands. I'm Sam, I have a master's in planning, but I've never worked as a planner, <laughs> so I actually feel very uh, beginner planner, um, and I've worked at the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board reviewing uh, funding applications for affordable housing. And I live in District 2, and I have no idea what my zoning district is, but it, Kim Cheney is my neighbor, so whatever his district is. Yeah, town I'm Street. Residential 9000, I'm guessing. Yeah, that would been right under the border. Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> They're, They're all good. They're all good. Yeah, res 9. <laughs> yes. To do There's with the minimum nine. lot size. Yeah, I prefer 3,000. Yeah. How urban you are. Yeah, just want to make sure. Yeah, well, yeah. A, a <laughs> residential 3,000 <laughs> types won't hold it against you. Yeah. <laughs> You're definitely not a beginner planner, by the way. I mean, it's um, there's a, a lot of word jargon that you you learn when you're here, but you already know all of that. And yeah, you know a lot about affordable housing, which is really nice. Um, okay, well, thanks, everyone. I appreciate that. I think it's good to kind of remind each other of our backgrounds, too. Um, so the next item on the agenda, item four, is general business. Comments from the public about something not on the agenda. We have some members of the public here. I don't know if you want to, if there's anything you want to. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I don't know So if you'll just introduce sure. yourself. So I'm Laura Rose Abbott. Um, I'm in District 1. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm happy. laughs> near you in Hubbard Park, so probably the same zoning. Um, I was at the October 22nd meeting, and John Snell was in to discuss 
the ISA A300 standards. And a number of you with your law background were kind of concerned about requiring something that we don't have on file, that we don't know what it contains. Um, I myself was concerned about that, so I called them and I talked to a rep and they sent me a catalog. Um, but they said that for cities, because that's like saying that we um, accept um, all engineering manuals as what we require in our zoning, like you really can't just say like we require it all because they could be pruning to a standard but doing the wrong pruning. It doesn't lead the public in a meaningful way and it doesn't protect the city um, in that you're requiring something that you don't know what it is or have. Um, so what they were suggesting is um, really the best management practices. Um, there's a combo of two volumes that for members are under $30. Um, but maybe even without it would be less than $100. But they're saying that, like, um, I, I'm encouraging you to maybe talk to a rep um, because I think it would be maybe um, erroneous to put the ISA as the standard that you're asking. Um, so I do have this catalog. And um, if you are interested in it, I could provide it to you. And I think at least the phone number for sure. Rep I mean, would I just. Really helpful. I, um, I called the ISA at uh, area code 217-355-9411. I mean, the whole thing took me 20 minutes, and I got lots of information. So Great. I'm encouraging you to do that. Um, you know, and then they'll set you up with a contact person or whatever, or maybe the tree board would like to join. It's not very expensive to be a member, and then you, you get your manuals um, at a greatly reduced rate rate. Um, my other concern arose during the October 22nd meeting just about the um, landscaping and screening um, proposed changes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just been mentioned a lot that it's really coming up in current projects. There's a few very large projects um, that are of interest to the public. And I've heard various things about the changes in these standards, um, how they would affect, for example, a parking garage that was maybe um, proposed prior to the change and when they were adopted. And, uh, you know, Mike said that um, the changes would affect the garage, but not the hotel since that plan had been accepted. But then when I spoke to the council, um, the city manager said, no, no, we never look back. So the, the garage would be the old regs. Um, so, and just changing them at this time is of concern to the public just because the screening on a structure as large as the garage to go from being a perimeter requirement to being um, less than that. Also with the street trees and the parking lot trees no longer being distinct trees, double counting of trees is a great concern for me and many members of the public. I wanted to bring that to you. Um, can you, can you, uh, what do you, can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by double, the double counting? What sure. What are you referring to? Um, maybe um, Mike spoke on that at the October 22nd meeting that, for example, if you have street frontage um, and you have to have so many trees out there, but behind it is a parking lot, um, the parking lot had its own distinct regulations for how many trees had to be in there in the asphalt or whatever. Um, but now he's proposing that it be changed or you are or I'm not sure about mm -hmm. how yeah, the administrative changing it. and the mm -hmm. executive interact in this commission. Um, but that the trees would no longer need to be both. You could just sit them on the street and count them as parking lot trees even though they're not in the parking lot. And also it was concerning that um, in a time of climate change that the parking lot trees who could help um, cool the cars and keep things cooler, you know, are, are not required to be where they're going to cast shade um, and various other things. But I know that these are still um, in your draft stage and it will be going to the council um, and wouldn't be adopted without public comment. 
Yeah, but we always appreciate yeah. having the public comment early on the process. Mm -hmm. it, it just makes it easier for us to incorporate changes. And mm -hmm. but, and I'm also guess I'm concerned about which projects are driving these changes, and I, I would like more information about yeah. that. Well, we are coming to that in on our agenda. We're going to talk okay. about them in you more length. Sit down and um, keep taking notes. Yeah, and and I'll invite you to come back up and give more comments Great. on them. And I appreciate just raise your that. hand if you if you hear something Great. and you Thank want you, some more information. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so. Um, the next, the next item on the agenda, item five, is to review the draft landscaping and screening standards. Uh, Mike, do you want to? Would you mind just giving us a quick summary of the October twenty second meeting? I, and well, maybe not of the whole meeting, but of where we are now in the discussion about landscaping, because we talked about it at a, at a meeting before that too, and how the way that the regs are written right now is fairly draconian. As yes. far as there's not a way, there's no point system or anything like that that would make, give some flexibility. And so that was the concern that we're trying to address. Yes. So there were a number of, of big picture concerns. And um, so one clarification um, for Ms. Abbott is uh, these, these do not work. Um, going backwards. So while we use these to, we may use the garage or these other projects as demonstrations examples. or examples. Mm -hmm. the, the garage is under the rules that are in effect, either, either under the rules that are in effect today or under the rules that were in effect before January 3rd, depending on the timing. I believe all of the parking garage is under the new rules, but any specific questions on the garage need to go through Meredith, who's the zoning administrator. But any changes we make here will not affect any ongoing applications. They only go into effect once they've been adopted. And any applications received after that date going forward will have to meet whatever changes we, we make. But a lot of them, a lot of these current projects have informed where our zoning have issues. So um, some of the issues, uh, like the counting the tree, one question we had was simply whether or not you can count a tree to meet two requirements. And we just had a discussion at the last meeting that said, well, we, if a tree meets the definition of a street tree and also meets the de definition of a parking lot tree, that's OK. You can count that tree both ways, but it has to meet the, the definition. It has to meet the definition of both requirements. And we had a number of things under the current zoning that just were either left unsaid, unspoken, were confusing, or we just had no way of, of making them workable. So what we tried to do, um, which was with uh, Meredith and myself, was to start to go through and try to come up with some changes to the rules. We restructured them to try to um, touch on as many of the important questions that needed to be answered. You know, the purpose remained the same. There were two versions. One's a, a red strikeout and one was a clean copy. I didn't make a lot of the clean copies because we had some. I do have a couple more if somebody wants. And this hasn't changed since the last meeting. So if somebody was short. One. This is the clean copy. I put the red strikeouts over there. I like having the strikeouts. Yeah, Some okay. people like strikeouts, yeah, and I saved a couple extra. Can I just ask a quick question about yeah. the, the red lines? Um, on the, at least on the copy that I have, there's, there's like a little red lines. Is there a... I, I said red lines, but green meant it was moved. Red means it was added, and on the right-hand side, it was where what things were deleted. Did you say that the, the strike through version here uh, reflects the changes we discussed last yeah, time? Yeah, these this should be the same as that. Just one is a. It's, it's so up to date though. Yes. So the previous one that was sent out would not be up to date. The head track changes on it. The, I guess the question is so. The track changes version that was discussed at October 22nd sounds like there were some other changes requested in that meeting. Were those incorporated into this latest draft? I 
because does this one does talk about the A300 standards. I'd, I'd have to go and look and see if there was a specific change that I can look at. It's dated November 7th. So, yeah. Uh, so that tells me it did incorporate. Yeah, so that happened. would have to have incorporated the changes. Um, let's see what I've got on this one to make, just to make sure that my, these two are the, look like they're the same. So it's just be tricky. This, this, We'll consider the November 7th version the most up-to-date, but I'm, I want to say these, these two are the same. All right. Well, as we walk through these, if um, anyone notices changes that a need to be made. A slight difference, then we'll know that the Please clean copy is the outdated one. Um, but the idea was to go through and have purpose, applicability, some application rules and administrative rules, I put all the planting specifications into one area um, before they really weren't in one consistent area. So we put them all in one area. And then starting in point F, we started to have the actual requirements um, where we talk about the general standards, which say all planting shall meet specific standards, shall not reduce planting areas, and um, shall protect plants as well during during the construction process. And then we start to get into a couple of different standards. So um, the street trees being one, the parking lot landscaping was two, screening was three, and total site landscaping was four. And then there were some last things at the end for nonconformities waivers, conditions, um, and then on the last page when it gets to plant, planting specifications, that's where some of the kind of the context things have changed quite a bit. We moved where the mature maintained height is so that way it becomes a definition. A large tree is defined as the mature height so they're right next to each other. Um, what's a large shrub, what's a medium shrub, what's a small shrub, how you measure the height, the minimum planting area required. So if you're gonna plant a large tree, it has to have 100 square feet of rooting surface. Um, and that also works in the other direction as we start to calculate how much planting material you need. So as opposed to using the border of the building as the, the size will come up with another factor that would tell us, because before it would tell you for every f linear foot or every five feet of building perimeter, you have to have a tree. And so depending on how big your building is, depending on the number of trees you would need, but it's not necessarily how big the parcel is or anything else. So we tried to come up with some new ways of calculating the amount of vegetation that would be needed. And that was, I think, what Stephanie wanted was for me to bring a couple of site plans, which I did bring, um, just to kind of go and work through what this would look like. Um, so I grabbed a couple of projects, uh, three of them, just so we can kind of see how it works. Um, well, and well, then let's do the can I ask a oh. quick question? Sure. Under figure 3-20, the minimum planting area width is that a whole new column? That is a whole new column. Okay, and is that defining literally, say, the, the space that we're going to allow for the tree well? Uh, it, yes, somewhat. Exactly. So you need to have 100 square feet, but you can't make it any narrower than five square feet. Then, um, then five just, feet. Then five, five feet, feet. Yeah. yes. Um, and the reason for that is we didn't want somebody to be able to go and play a game by making a, planting a large tree in a, in a two foot by 20 foot right. area yeah. to go through and say, well, it's got to at least be five feet. And that standard, uh, which surprised me a little bit, that standard five foot, four foot, three foot actually appears in a number of um, larger cities. Um, I looked at Portland's and a couple other places which had some um, 
things, and they actually were okay with these five foot by 20 foot tree wells for a large tree because the roots actually would expand out to where they could to fill to take take in that moisture. So the tree board's okay with those numbers. Yep, I did review these with John, um, John but Snell. They do seem small to me, you know that. It's it's it, tree with only a five foot diameter. Wow. Well, it wouldn't be five foot diameter. It'd be five by twenty. Five yeah. Minimum. Minimum of five. Yeah. Um, we can certainly go to make things uh, bigger, and the tree requirements I did find were bigger in other communities. A large tree in some places would be required. Could be required to have two hundred and fifty. The issue that starts actually coming up is it could start working against you because if you don't have enough area to plant a large tree, then you don't have to plant a large tree. Yeah. So you actually could end up coming in and getting less trees because in a built environment like we have, um, we may have only a, a 10 by 10 area in the front of the house that we can officially designate for the tree well. I guess the other area I'm concerned about, maybe that this doesn't pertain, is that this may force people to plant trees too close to a foundation because they because they can. And um, eventually that's going to either damage the building or it's going to kill the trees. So I'm, I was just surprised to see those numbers. Yeah, I think there's going to have to be a certain amount of uh, flexibility in working with the rules. We need to have some objective rules, but I think we have to have some subjective judgment that goes in um, because I did ask John directly should we have a setback requirement for certain trees and he didn't feel like that was an important he didn't feel that was as, as important as these other factors that we were looking well, at. Well he's not he, he's he's not the architect so yeah. he's thinking about the tree health <laughs> and you're thinking about what? the yeah. he's looking at the get, trees health yeah and you're, you're looking about, possibly at the, the foundation. Tree, yeah it has other areas but eventually yeah. it will it will break through the foundation as it's growing. So, um, yeah. Because also, isn't it true that for a large tree, that essentially the the diameter of its crown is the area that it, its root system takes? Is that reasonably yeah. accurate? Uh, As a certified yes. floodplain manager, I'm hoping you can answer. Uh, I, I <laughs> did. Pretty... I've done some work. I mean, I, I, having my degree in in ecology, you know, reaching back into that. Yes, but it's going to. It it will fill the box that it has. Yeah. It's and. As I said, I was surprised to see that other communities, you know, the New York cities and and these other places we're okay with these 5 by 20s or right. 4 they, by 20s they and, have a choice and because you're so just dense. yeah but yeah. To, to to think that they were talking about trying to get larger trees in there i think um it kind of goes back a little bit to the subjective side of it you have to look as as john was pointing out to me so much of it depends on what's what's there what's the context that that tree is being planted in is it a um a single story cottage or is it a three story brick face on the south side you know your tree is going to interfere differently and is going to react differently a single family co uh, you know bungalow the tree is just going to grow up and expand over its roots will look for its um, it's it's where it can have its material to bed um, I think the one of the big things to to keep in mind about this is we currently have had, certainly before January, um, no requirements at all for this. You just would be required to have a tree um, or not even have a requirement to have a tree. You just had to meet certain landscaping and screening standards. So we've moved to a point where we've started to require a certain number of trees. And, and now to go through and say, if you're going to have a tree, you're going to have to have a certain planting area. And we're going to require that it meet a certain standard. Now, whether we've got the right numbers in those boxes, I think um, I'll rely on the tree board The tree yeah. board and, and other experts in the field who go through and say, if they think these need to be better or different, by all means, I will recommend changing them. Um, 
but this was th these were what I pulled together from yeah. some of the research I did, and I think it's an it's an improvement. I think we should require a minimum planting area, whether that's 100 square feet or 250 square feet, <laughs> whether five feet wide. In fact, there were no requirements for widths. Um, I added that in because I felt we need to at least have some something. widths. Yeah. There has to at least yeah. be something, and whether it should be five feet or whether it should be um, if it's 10 feet, then it's a requiring a 10 by 10 square. Um. I have a request for a change back on, in part, 3203.e, which is page 3-58. Mm -hmm. um, that This is the planning specifications section or provision. It says, planning shall meet the following standards. Um, three is the one... Mm -hmm. that we're receiving comments on from Laura Rose. Um, and I'll come back to that. I want to ask your thoughts on this. But um, four and five seem to be saying the same thing. So four says use of invasive plant materials is prohibited. And five says use of native plant materials is strongly encouraged. So I would just request that we just strike out number five. So it can be foreign and not invasive. Okay. Okay. That's fine. There is. There, yeah. there's, okay. Yeah. Never mind. And, and on number three, I think there's an issue with, um, it says planting should be in accordance with the standards and policies of the Montpelier Tree Board, but they don't have any standards and policies. Yeah. I, I thought we changed that language. I think this was our compromise language, I think. This was the compromise? Which is, it's really weak, and it's just, and just, just to, to update you, it's, it's saying that it will meet the requirements of the tree board, which roughly follow ANSI, which, does not give guidance to the public very well at all. If this was coupled by like something maybe on the city website that mm -hmm. actually had the mm -hmm. tree board's adopted standards, that would be one thing. But without that, then yeah, I'm not comfortable with this provision either. So a lot of us weren't last time. I thought we'd soften it a little more than that though, even, and included, there's a note in here that prom prompted me, uh, my memory. But we were gonna add a reference that they could consult with the tree board if they were interested, and I don't know where that ended up, but I thought that that was mm -hmm. part of this particular update that we made to... Or was it something to like they had to meet a standard and then they could consult with them to determine whether or not they, they met that, or... I can't remember, but, but I don't think it. they, yeah, they have standards or policies adopted, so we can't require them to follow something that's not a three, I thing. Think that's why I think, I think we could keep three and we could say, if... if formally adopted or something like that, add a qualifier that the three is meaningless or without teeth unless the tree board actually adopts real standards itself and not and doesn't just rely on the fancy <clears throat> ones. Yeah, that's true. You, we could just strike everything from which to the end and put if adopted in there, plantings. And then you actually could change the should to be a shall because it obviously would be then. Planting shall be in accordance with the standards and policies of the Montpelier Tree Board if adopted. Why don't you just say planting shall be in accordance with all adopted or standards and policies adopted by the Montpelier Tree Board? Yeah. <clears throat> well, if we don't know what that is, is that a little? Seems <laughs> kind of odd. Well, if, if nothing, if nothing's adapted, then it's neither here nor there. But one, when, when in, once the tree board does adopt it. But do, we, right, but if they do, but we they, do they have plans on adopting anything? Like if they're not going to, it seems like a bit misleading to allude to something that no one has an intention on creating. Sure, but it, I think it serves as, right, we don't we wouldn't anyway, be able to. Languages, but it serves as a placeholder, and I think it's helpful in the event that. Well, it sounds like Laura Rose might have something to add to that. So let's, let's hear what when she When I has. talked to the ISA rep, the, he had just spoken in his experience that he's worked with a lot of municipal, you know, people who are doing their planning, zoning um, work, and that the best practices does, you know, it's, it's not, it's for lay people. The manuals that he was recommending, I think, would be a low-cost investment, but it would actually give people the ability to come and see a resource that could actually make more successful plantings. John Snell talked a lot that people put in their trees to meet the requirements and then they just die and then there's no trees. Like you don't go back 
in five years and see if that tree's alive and say, hey, you know, we let you put on your porch, but you didn't keep the tree alive. So we want the trees to live. So it's like a, a low cost guide that, that could even help the tree board. Because I was kind of like, he didn't know the standards or have access to them, but he was sort of following them. But I couldn't tell that he was because he didn't have them. And yeah, I mean, that's definitely outside our area of expertise. I don't think we can come up with the, the standards for the tree. I mean, we could, but we probably yeah, have but to. It, it does sound like the, the, uh, the ISA already has developed a best management guide. That's, that's for municipal that's, use. It's, it's for the public to interface with the municipality for guidance. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just for people who have home gardens who want to do it you know, and work with the planning department on their application, and it's something easy that they can actually use. So I, I got my materials pretty quickly. But I mean, you could also leave it vague, and there's no guidance, but it doesn't solve what John was suggesting that you know we want better results in the plantings. So this language that the tree board generally follows this manual or the standards. These standards, yeah. That implies that there can be some deviation. Is there deviation we want to build in there? That's what that's what he said. Um, right. I think he wanted he wanted to retain that flexibility, but he wanted, as uh, she said, to make sure that people yeah. take care to plan it the right way. Oh, we're getting it, into the JIM golf void yes. for vagueness issue yes. here. Yeah, I think this this is void for vagueness as it's written. Yeah. But we and but we could set it up where the tree board could in, could then come in later and fill in what the standards are. I think I think that's a pretty good approach. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think the approach of saying, you know, the planting shall be in accordance with the standards of the tree board and then making a recommendation to the tree board that they adopt the best management guides rather than the ISA standards or the ANSI standards or that they adopt a both or a combination of both because if the best management guides are a much easier and a much simplified way of doing it, then it makes sense that we wouldn't. There's no sense adopting a big fat manual of guides <coughs> of, of requirements when we could get away with a, a much more straightforward process. But I would leave that up to the tree board to make a determination of what their standards are. You know, I mean, we could make a recommendation that they explore the best management guides, but if they think they're, they really think it's so in the best interest to have a technical, a very technical guide that they want to do the ANSI 300s, then. Are you thinking that we would just make a separate recommendation to them that's not in the, the zoning, right? Well, it depends what we do for number three. We can, we can remove, if we remove number three, then we have no review of the planting standards. So we would need to have some standard. If we choose, we could insert the best management guides for planting, but we would probably want to get a copy and take a quick look, make sure it is what meets our, our needs. You know, I'll, I'll order up a copy and have them get it shipped here and we can take a look at it and see is this doing what we think it that we want it to do um, or the other possibility would be to reference it and then simply you know reference anything that's adopted by the Montpelier tree board and then make a recommendation to the tree board that says you know you guys have been kind of doing things your your way of doing things and if we're going to be official and we're going to require people to do things, then we have to be much more formal. And yeah. I think sometimes these ad hoc groups aren't used to having to meet a legal requirement where we can go right. through and say, you must do this. Yeah. You must do it this way. And if they want us to be able to do that, they're going to have to go and step up and say, these are our rules, and you're going to have to meet these rules. And hopefully there's, hopefully that best management guide kind of fits that purpose because we're not New York City Parks Department. We're so Montpelier Tree Board. <laughs> I think even if we have a provision here that says plantings need to be in accordance with the standards and policies of Mont Montpelier Tree Board if the standards are adopted or however we want to word it, that's still a little bit unclear because 
we're not referencing a specific set of, I mean, we're, we're just sort of referencing a, a, a document that may or may not have that title. Um, so that, so that, that's a little bit concerning to me. That's a little bit vague. And then um, we don't know what what they would put together. That's so. the part that's confusing, for, right? If, if we don't know what the set is, we're saying they have to follow something, we don't know what it is yet. So, so I feel a little weird about so I, that. I, I think that's fine. So it, if Walter, it sounds like the thread that you're talking about with wanting to provide the tree board, with, give the, the tree board deference in terms of crafting the standards by which this would adhere to, that's fine. I think the language that would serve as a placeholder that Wesley's talking about does just that. So I think there's a benefit to applicants. First off, I think it gives the tree board deference to craft standards so long as they are formally adopted by a rule, you know, under their rules, then then I think we if we're okay with giving them the deference and trust them with that, then that's good. More importantly, it gives puts applicants on notice that this is the standard by which we're gonna use. Like you should consult with the tree board to determine what their standards are. If there is nothing in place at the time, the tree board just says, we don't have any standards right now. And they say, fine, then move on. But once there's standards that are operative, then this document has already anticipated that, and you know, we don't have to revisit that issue later on. And there's a standard in place, and the applicant's already on notice of that right now. Um, the t it's just a timing issue, really, after that point. So that's kind of... Uh, yeah. Well, but we could... Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, wouldn't the, the public process for adopting a, a policy or standard be the same as what we would have to go through and isn't it our job to adopt those um, those regulations so the you know deferring to the tree board which I, I'm not even sure if they can or if they have the authority to adopt a, a standard um, or policy that would be used in sort of quasi judicial hearings you know, and if they can just adopt them without a public process, well, that has this other yeah. issues because then they could just change it at will or, you know, on some random Tuesday night and then change it back for another property owner. So I'm just wondering, I like the intent of it, but I, are we just getting, wouldn't it be simpler to say, hey, come up with some standards, give them to us, we'll put them in the zoning. Yep. Mm. But I think they need more guidance than just come up with some standards. That's the, the issue we're running into because I think that they may be under the impression they've given us some standards to include already. So well, I can certainly get back to John and give him some, some of the additional information on the best management guides and, and certainly we can order up a copy of those so he can take a review at them mm -hmm. on, his, on his end. Um, can we look at like a few places that, like, what have other places done? We can't be the first to. Yeah, this. I mean, his we we could adopt our own. We could create Maybe and draft our own standards. <laughs> <laughs> um, the advantage of some of the that, and this was what John had pointed out. The advantage of some of the ANSI A three hundred standards is that it's a it's it's the standard. It's uh, anyone who comes in from. Burlington or Plattsburgh or anywhere else, um, New Hampshire, if they're in, in landscaping, they would understand what those standards are and what their requirements are. And it's not a unique um, set of standards. That sort of implies you need a landscape architect to... Well, you do for any major site plan, we require okay. a landscape architect. Okay. Um, but it gives a, it gives a certain... Um, if we had this shortened guide, then that should be able to help with, you know, if they adopted the best managements as opposed to the A300s, then that's, that would be the, that would be the change. Um, it would be just a, a stricter set of standards and we would have to buy a copy, have it down in our office and we would have to learn how to enforce the A300s and I think that's, it sounds like it's a much more complicated um, set of rules and requirements. But John's concern was um, right now we're just planting trees and because we're not doing it right, they're not thriving. And if we're going to start to require trees, we should make sure that they're in a condition that they can thrive. And so we should have the proper soil, we should have the proper depth, they should be planted at the proper time, they should be staked properly. 
I, I agree that I think that the best approach for us to take would be to have the tree board give us a set of standards without referring to an outside document, even if it means that cutting and pasting from the outside document so then to give us their standards and then for us to I think it would be okay to reference an outside source if if they if they adopt it, we could go through and say, let's say for example, it is the best management guide for planting. Um, we could put that in as our standing planting shall be in accordance with the um, best management guides for planting produced by this group. I don't think there's because we we reference a lot of those in other regulations. The flood hazard rules reference. You know, if you're going to be elevating, you need to meet. Or if you're going to be flood proofing, you have to meet the flood proof standards of technical bulletin 1.01. And that's just, you know, we don't have to go through and reprint the technical bulletins back into our zoning bylaws. Um, well, I guess part of my thought process was that, that he, if he wanted to, to generally follow those standards and only adopt part of them, then I think that would be the way to do it was to be to create our own. I think the the requiring, I mean, if, if we require a licensed landscape architect or certified horticulturalist, that's something to keep in mind for, and these are, this is site plan review. So if we're dealing with a certified professional in this industry, then just like we do for engineers and require them to meet a certain standard that I'm sure, you know, your office is not, doesn't understand whether the structural integrity of you know, whatever is being proposed in a spec, they have they rely on that seal, right? Uh, yeah, in certain in certain cases, we'll and we'll spot check those with the engineering department if it's there. Right, you could ask for an independent technical review if it's yeah. the stakes are yeah, higher. Yeah, we had ge yeah geotech studies for various projects for soil st stability and so I don't know if the ASLA has. The ASLA has, I don't know. Some kind of policy or standard, standard that we could apply. Is that what you're saying? Right. Or, you know, if we tell them, hey, meet this A300 standard, what does that mean to you? Like, is that something people are asking you to do? Or is there something else? Or I, mean, I think it's helpful for any applicant to know what the standard is and to be able to actually physically look at it, right. regardless of whether or not they're the licensed person. So, I mean, at this point, if we were to go back and ask the tree board to come forward with uh, a standard, some kind of a standard that they would use, what happens to subsection three? Do we just eliminate it until the time that they actually come forward with something? Uh, yeah, I mean, we can just strike it out and then four, five, six, seven, just jump up in number. And then once they have adopted it, we plug it in, or we just put it in as a placeholder. We could put in a placeholder that requires consultation with the tree board. I'm not sure that's going to, like requiring a certified landscape architect to consult with the tree board. I'm just trying to think creatively here. I, I don't even know what the, what the, what's under the purview of these A300 things. Like, what are we talking about? I have no idea at this point. <laughs> <laughs> if you pay a hundred dollars, you can find out. Well, we, well we I mean, were, it's just we there's this is this. not all of it, but it's just well, like every it. little tiny. So this kind is of the ISA though. That's different from the the A three hundred standards are there. Oh, okay. so are there's, there's yeah. like a, there's a gazillion manuals. It's like everything under the sun in the plant yeah. world, but they also have things that are more urban-minded, but this is not an extensive catalog. The best thing to do really is to talk to a rep, because once I said it was for municipal zoning, he said, well, what you really need is this, you know, because it's simple, hmm. it's, you know, not so, but it's, you know, utility pruning. <laughs> I mean, it's everything under the sun. Mm. I mean, the I, tree board doesn't know this stuff. I yeah, mean, they don't I, have them. I think, John, I think you bring up a good question, like a good threshold question, like whether or not, the, I don't know. No, yeah, it, it could recommend a city council. Oh, uh, yeah, they could. They they would adopt them through the city through the city council. Yeah. Yeah, the tree board's responsibilities, their their jurisdiction is within the city's right of way. So they're they've been 
appointed um, to manage the city's trees that are within the city's right of way. So even on your private property, if you own a tree that is actually on the city's land, you can't cut down your tree without first contacting the tree board and because it's technically a public tree. Um, so the tree board's responsible for managing those. And they also will take down damaged and what are they, uh, trees that can fall on power lines or other things, they'll take down trees. So the Sometimes. property owners don't have to. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so what do we want to do with number three in the meantime? <laughs> like going back to the tree board and asking them to either accept yeah some national standard that's easily understandable to landscape architects makes the most sense to me with the wording the number three um, with the standards and policies of the monthly of the tree board when adopted I mean, I think we could just say planting should be in accordance with the standards and policies of whatever standards it is. And it doesn't have, we don't have to <coughs> mention the tree board in here at all, actually. We could just reference the... But we don't know what that standard is right now. Right, well, we wait for the tree board to oh. make a recommendation, but then we just plug in. So, I mean, the language, I think we could just strike the... Can we leave that open? Montpelier tree board, which generally follows the... I'll just have the standards and policies of the ANSI A300 standards. If that's the one we want, if they recommend we fault we have in here, or ASI, whatever the municipal one is. Yep. So right now we would just say in accordance with adopted standards and policies. Um. Because we can't reference a standard now. We don't have the. I know, but uh, I mean, I, I think I mean, we can just we have to leave it. On I think we just have to leave it blank that it would just go and say the. Planting shall be in accordance with the following standards and policies, and then it's just blank until, yeah. until we fill it. Okay. And, I mean, we're just going to have to come back to it. I think if we're going to come back to it, why don't we just re remove it for now? Yeah. And then come back with something that's all one piece. Okay. Because keeping in mind that we don't currently have planting standards in our zoning so it's not like we're we're we are we are yeah. taking a step backwards we tried to take a step forwards and we're now going to kind of revisit that and go back to where we are which which is that we didn't have any trees we didn't have any planting standards and it was a recommendation from the tree board that we should have these standards we need to but until we get it right we really can't make it a we can't make it a law until it's ready all right does everyone agree about that? Okay. Motion to, well, we just, by consent, we are going to remove 3203.E3. Okay. Um, are there any other small changes to the language here that we want to discuss before we walk through the site plan? apply these to the site plan no all right Mike all right see how these work in uh, so you can see from from the red lines that were in the red line document that most of what you have now is new, new. <laughs> we we had to kind of make stuff that would work because so much wasn't working um, and really the big things that Stephanie had pointed out um, that we really kind of wanted to look at was how when we get to the total landscaping and we get to these J2 and J3, um, I really kind of had to come up with this weird 3-61 uh, and 3-62. So how the mental games we played downstairs we, we went through a bunch of different options for how to go and say how much landscaping do you need to have and we kind of looked at things like well if it's a small lot versus a big lot 
um, if it's a district that has a lot of required open space or doesn't have a lot of required open space, I mean, it, it just changed so much. So what we tried to do is to come up with, and if you don't follow it, it's okay. If, you, if you're allowed to have 80% coverage, then you're allowed to have 20%, then you have to have 20% open. How much of that 20% should be landscaped? And so we kind of came up with, we'll make it a third, just threw a number in there and said, we'll make it 30% of that has to be. And then if it's 70%, it's a third of the 30% remaining. And so you can see how we just went with these factors. And then we took a bunch of applications and we ran them through and kind of tested them. And it kind of worked to a point until it got to be big parcels. And then all of a sudden, everything started falling apart. You started ending up needing thousands and thousands of square feet. So we came up with two, which says if a lot is one acre or less, then you have to follow these ah. factors. And three says if the parcel is greater than one acre, then these are the factors that you need to have. These are the minimum landscaping. And we've started to, as I said, work through some of these. And it certainly is a lot better. These rules now have more flexibility. They have non-conforming rules. They have waiver rules. So we have ways of mm -hmm. short-circuiting it. If this doesn't work, the DRB will have a chance to short-circuit it. Under the current rules today, there is no short-circuit. So we end up with rules that just have some odd outcomes, and there's nothing we can do about it. So the first application and again none of these applications actually have to meet these standards these are Can I ask a quick question yep um, so if you were looking at 3203 j2 minimum planting areas for parcels up to include one acre in size then what you're saying is that how does this translate into what percentage has to be open um, the district if it's 70 percent Maximum, maximum coverage, coverage, then by the inverse, 30% of it has to... Oh, okay, uncovered, not necessarily uncovered. open space. Not necessarily yes. open space. Okay, open space, I was getting confused with that requirement. Okay, so we're not setting up specific requirements. Yeah, and then it turns out that it, it, a, a bunch of things actually ended up canceling each other out when you did the math, so it was it, it made the formula rather unique. You just take your amount of impervious cover and you multiply it times this factor and it'll tell you how much landscaping you need. And if somebody really wants to see the math, I can go through and show it to them. But, um, so the first one I'll show you is Caledonia Spirits. See where our microphones are. We try not to cover our microphones because it makes things pretty awful at home. So this is Caledonia Spirits. We have Berry Street. We have the railroad tracks. We have the access going in. You see the new skeleton of a structure getting built right now. Um, so this was their proposal, and they came in with a landscape plan that looks something like this. So this is something we would get, whether it's us or the DRB members. So the question comes up, okay, is this in compliance with our landscaping standards? Um, so this is 116 Gin Lane. It's in the Riverfront District. It has an 80% coverage requirement. So you can cover it with 80% impervious cover. Um, it's exempt from the street tree requirement because it's not on a street. Um, so uh, the first one that would come up that we would be looking at as a standard is the parking. We roughly measured out the size of the parking, which is has a little more than 20,000 square feet of parking. And by the way, this is like a four acre parcel, roughly. Um, and so 20,000 square feet is, is a half an acre of parking. And we have to cover as a requirement in here, which is the same as under our the rules passed in January, 40% shade. And we kept the shade requirements the same, a large tree would be worth 1,200 square feet and a small tree would be worth 600 square feet. These guys here are birch trees, um, river birch. So I don't know if those are technically a medium tree or a large tree, but if it's a large tree, they would be worth 14,000 
square feet of shade or 7,200 square feet of shade, depending on whether it's considered a large or medium tree. We'd have to figure that out. One of our staff would have to figure that out. Um, the requirement is you need to shade 40%. 40% of 20,000 is 8,000. So it would meet this if river birches are, in fact, large trees. Then we have 14,000 square feet of shade for the 8,000 square foot requirement. Are we, then we have to count these too. But those were those. shrubs, those so shrubs. those were not big enough. They're not big enough to count. Okay. To count as shade. For a parking lot. So yeah. Oh, right, because it's screening, but not But they shade. did count for screening. Okay. Um, so um, depending on whether these were large or medium, so if these turned out to be um, medium trees, they don't have enough to meet our requirement, and they would have to plant some more trees, which if it were staff, we would probably have suggested you know, somewhere in this area that they could go and add some more trees that would add some not only benefit to the shade, but would also provide some benefit to water quality to the river. So um, that just gives an idea that, well, the numbers weren't impossible to meet. Are they too easy, too generous? This, these rules were the same rules that Brandy had proposed and were adopted in January. So I didn't change these in this new draft. Doesn't, um, if this is four acres, don't they, the way I'm reading this is they would just have to put in 2,100 square feet of landscaping. Uh, that's, you're, you're up at the total landscaping. I was working my way through. Oh. Um, so the first one I did was the, the parking lot landscaping. Uh, they didn't say they, they had the planting size, but they didn't have the, what would be the full height. Well, I would probably okay. have asked Enveloped. them to include the mature height of yeah. the tree in their report that they submitted to us. We would probably not do the work ourselves. We'd probably ask them and then confirm I mean, well, that so information. It would be helpful to you, too, to see that illustrated on potentially on the plan. If we assume that what they are actually indicating is the planted diameter of the crown, mm -hmm. wouldn't it help you too to have an idea of how big that crown might grow in terms of shading? Uh, it's As our rules are written, all we care about is that it is a large tree <laughs> that has the trunk of the tree within 10 feet, because under the current rules that Brandy had proposed, we didn't have a distance. So as we were enforcing her rules that, that we had adopted, we had a question of, you know, we'd have a tree over here. Does yeah. that count as a, shade you know, we, do, does it count as right. a shade tree? Because, you know, so we, we've got to follow the logical rules. I think the detail you're getting at is what would be under the standards that we, the tree board doesn't have yet. Oh, well, that would be great. That's what yeah. it sounds like. Yeah. I mean, because having the space for the root system is probably something that keeps the tree alive. Oh, were you asking about the no, roots or were you asking about the crown? I was asking about the crown so that uh, we could Because a maple tree would have a bigger than an elm. An yes. elm tends to grow up in little tufts at the top. The square footage requirements are in here. Yeah. The square footage requirements are here. This hasn't been measured out yet, but under the new rules, under the rules adopted in January, we wouldn't be looking at whether these, each of these trees has 100 square feet or 49 square feet. If these are medium trees, which I actually think they are medium yeah. trees, yeah. each one of these trees would have to demonstrate that it has 49 square feet of rooting area. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we would want to go through, you're going to have to space these things out, and they're going to have to demonstrate to us, um, show us, show us the breakdown of that. And that may mean this has to get bigger to accommodate more roots. But right. as this was adopted, there were no requirements for that. Under the new rules, we would be requiring it. I think these are mediums. I think they would have to have that much rooting area. So you'd want each tree to be indicated with the rooting area if, allocation, dashed in or something Yep, to that dashed effect. in or something to that effect. So, it, you know, and they can share as long as there's enough, you know, as long as these two are 98 square feet. Oh, to get, um, yeah. Because they can, the, the two trees can share root space, but the physical planting of these trees is what we were just talking about. When I go to plant this tree, what should the soil mix be? How yeah. deep does this tree have to be planted? How big is of a yeah. root ball do we expect on it? Um, do we leave the burlap on, take the burlap off? Whatever the rule, I don't know this stuff. That's for that branch. But 
my, my guess is that that's how we would be evaluating this from our standpoint. Then when we get to point J, um, the requirement that we were just talking about for total landscaping. So we had the screening requirements. As I said, I screening requirements, you have to screen parking lots. I would have said this is a screened parking yeah. lot. What about screening of the delivery area, though? Uh, that would be a, a question. So we have to, we now have very specific things that we have to screen for. Mm -hmm. We must screen, we can use landscape buffers, we can use fences and walls, and we can use berms. We have three things we can screen with, and we must screen the parking lots, utilities, service areas, building mounted equipment. So we have four things we must screen for. Um, That's in the existing document. These were re re reorganized and kind of put in there, but okay. yes, they were mostly in there, just moved into different places to make it work a little better. So, in fact, under uh, a new proposal that came in, they actually revised this plan in 2018 and they put um, a generator over here. And we've required them to, to put screening, and so there's actually now cedars over here because mm, this is okay. 2017. So any of these things here is what our, um, what Meredith would be looking at in order to either approve it if it's a minor site plan or to put into a staff report for the DRB to consider. She would go through and make the evaluations of these different things to go through and say screening has been presented and it would be up to the DRB to determine if it's sufficient. Mm -hmm. And it would be up to the public to make a comment that's not sufficient to meet the, the to protect the views. In fact, I think it probably would be okay. This is an elevated site compared to Berry Street, so probably that um, would be good. As we get to total site landscaping, we now are to the, that calculating area where we would need to find out how much, because this is more than one acre, and that means we would be talking about number three, because this is riverfront, it's 80%. So that means they must provide a minimum landscaping of 2,178 square feet. So those little, that table that we had, every tree needs 100. Well, now we're counting every tree is 100 square feet of planting area. And we need to reach that 2,000 square feet. They had the table over here. Very helpful. I could go through and calculate that. That's 192 square feet for Aronia, which I don't even know what that is. 588 for the birch. That's assuming it's a medium. 25 for the crab apples. One crab apple. The 162 for the cranberries. 294 for elderberries. 348 for wintergreen. Winterberry. 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 Uh, for a total of 1,609 square feet. So using these new formulas, it comes out, uh, I believe, what did I say? It's going to come out low. It's, uh, so yeah, yep. so mm -hmm. it is going to come out almost 500, 500 um, short under the new system. So actually, this new rule would have required them to plant more trees. If, if you look at this site, it's five acres, and there's very little planting out here. Right. So. The fact that we would have required them to plant five more trees, five more potentially large trees, they could have very easily dropped five trees. Large. We also we also pointed out that they were probably deficient on their parking for shading. So yeah. they probably we probably would have recommended that they go one, two, three, four, five, get some large trees south side. South side. Um, and it probably would have very easily, it's not something that would have been a burden for them to have met that requirement for this. And that square footage is that you were assuming were the minimum planting areas? The minimum planting areas. So 100 square feet for a large tree. 100 square feet okay. for a large tree. Right. So when we say they're 500 square feet short, I quickly just can... Five large trees. Five large trees. Yeah. They could, they, they're, they're welcome to put whatever they would like. If they want to put 10 medium trees, that's... The, the flexibility is in their, their control that decide how they want to landscape it, but we would be requiring them to have a little bit more in this plan. And you could make recommendations as to where to place them. And we could make recommendations as to where to place them. Although I think we could require them to do the parking because I do think their shading is uh, is not sufficient. Yeah. I mean, I question the shading. Is yeah. too, but. 
Why do we get rid of the relationship to impervious surface? It seems a bit arbitrary to say once a lot is greater than this, you need this much trees the or planting area. Once it gets over an acre, you mean? Right, and we're talking it's, about lot size and not it, acre. Yeah, it has to do with as the, and again, I came up with a way that I thought might work. So we're, there are many ways we could attack this issue. Um, what happens is once things start getting bigger is because we've been working on the inverse. Um, so what percentage of the rest needs to be landscaped? Then when if you end up with needing a percentage of a very large parcel, you can end up with a very large landscaping requirement. So I tried to kind of move away from that and come up with a factoring. But for these, since they're flat numbers and not a factor, if this is only a two acre parcel, they have to have, like if it's only this piece, they'd have to have way more trees. Yes. Right, if you're like 1.01 1. You would, 1 you'd, acres. Because this is four acres, multiply that number times four. Basically, would be your answer. Why, why wouldn't, because you'd have to have 8,400 square feet of plantings. Are you saying that Wait, is? If, we, if we continue that pro, that same factor forward, that's that's where it caps out at one acre. So at one acre, so it's not multiplying by the amount of impervious surface. It it is, but if you if you kept the f if you only used the factor that's in J two, right? And you said I've got a factor, I'm going to make this work. When you apply that factor to a large parcel, um, like in this case. That factor works good for all the small parcels on Berry Street. That factor number in two. But as you get bigger than an acre, that factor number starts not working. Because as in this case, we would have to have 8,000 square feet, which would be another 85 more trees planted on this site. But, is, right. but you're multiplying it by the site size, not by the amount of impervious surface. Yes. Because it's not just, I, I see mean, what you're saying. Yes. Aesthetics. If they if they met the if they if this were eighty percent coverage, then they would need eighty more trees. So they probably don't have But they're not maxing out their coverage. They're not maxing out their coverage. They actually have a coverage of seventy nine thousand square feet. So shouldn't we just shouldn't we use that? Uh, I actually brought my Right, because if it's a much smaller, if it's only a two-acre parcel, that's a, that's a lot more trees on that site. So, well, it's the same amount of trees, but in a much smaller amount of space for two acres compared to five. Right, we're going from something that's like closely tied to what's being built to something that's kind of like, well, put your 2,000 square feet, whether you have 50 more acres or So this would be one. Or two. site size. In, in this specific case, using the coverage of the buildings that are there, the result would be 4,937 square feet of landscaping. Including the parking lot, so all impervious? That's all That's impervious. All yep. That right. has 79,800, so it would be actually a little bit more. So we could round that off to almost to, to 5,000 as opposed to, what did we say it was, 2,100? So you'd be doubling, doubling the landscaping if you wanted to kind of remove number three. Um, or, or we can come up with another mechanism. But I did know when we, did, when we tried these figures earlier, they worked for small lots. And then as we got to bigger lots. So how did you, how, what do you mean when you say they worked for small lots? Right? How did you We would take success? projects, we would take a project which we could get to if we get some time, for Elm Street, which is, some of you guys might recognize, uh, like 187 Elm Street, it's across from the cemetery. Um, and they had a proposal, you know, and the building covers a big chunk of the lot. Uh, they have a carriage barn in back. They've got very little green space, you know. And so when you look at a, a 5,000 square foot parcel with a 
three thousand square foot building on it, you know, can you still meet the landscaping requirements? Well, you can, because these factors don't require an inordinate number of trees and shrubs. Um, but you're seeing for larger parcels. But once you get to larger parcels, number. Those or yeah, or not. I mean, we just gave gave the figure. We were assuming we. So the first question is. I converted from a system. The old system said we're going to measure the perimeter of the building, mm -hmm. and for every five feet of perimeter, you have to have a shrub, and for every thirty feet, you have to have a tree. And they can be anywhere on the site. So buildings that jog in and out a lot and have a lot of context have more perimeter than just a big square box. So if you want to avoid landscaping, make a big square box. Probably not what we would like to be encouraging. But it ends up with weird things because this building lot could be just this big, in which case they have a building and they have no place to plant their 87 trees that they're required to build or plant. The standards that Brandy had proposed with this work well in suburban model proposals, which is why it would work for this. And her proposals would work for timber homes, which is the next example that I have, um, which is out on Elm Street as well. Same standard supply. You've got a nine acre lot. All right, how many trees do you need? And, and how are we going to handle small building on a really big parcel? Um, but what I did was we're not going to take building perimeter. We threw that out and we replaced it with these planting areas because we felt that was going to be what we really wanted to do was to say impervious cover for all for whatever impervious cover you have. You're going to have to have a percentage of landscaping. Basically kind of mitigating the effect mitigating it and you can and we're going to let you double count so you can count your trees you can count your street trees and you can count your parking lot trees towards your total landscaping but if you happen to say aha i'm exempt from the street trees aha i'm exempt from parking lot you're still going to have some landscaping and you're going to have to put it somewhere and these are the requirements that we would like to see mm -hmm. i just don't understand why we changed them at one acre Right, that's me too. <laughs> uh, and it could change at a different number. As I said, this this particular proposal um, at four acres would require an additional, what did we say? So, which I, so I don't know that that's right. So for a four acre parcel, that makes sense. But I'm worried about like the one and a half acre parcel, what that means. For oh, whether the break should have been at, at one and a half or two rather than one. Right. So if this parcel was half the size, but it still required more trees that are currently on here. That's, I'm, I'm not sure what that looks like. I'm worried that might be asking too much of a parcel that's just over the one acre. Or I just don't see why we need to break the relationship with the amount of impervious surface. It seems Square footage and not per why not keep I guess, I guess the core question is why did you guys find that lots over an acre, the, the formula that you used for acre and below lots didn't work in the larger one? Right. Uh, it was mostly just doing some trial and trial and error on some of these. Um, but what what did you want? Um, like this, so this, this would require double, but this is a huge lot with a bunch of impervious surface without a whole lot of landscaping. Like it wouldn't have been hard to add more trees here. They've got a ton of space to work with. So if perimeter doesn't make sense, can we look at square footage of impervious? Right. Okay. Instead. So there's some justification, some that makes standards to use. Yeah, and I think the, the issue comes up is the ability to meet those requirements based on the amount of available space that's left. I mean, if, if the impervious cover data is too, the number is too high, then maybe we should be lowering that. That that would help to create more green space. But in this case, they because these made seventy nine thousand. The multipliers you have work with all the max coverages, right? So presumably yes. you're going to have enough space by definition. 
to put all of this, and they don't seem overly, I mean, they seem fairly attainable, right? Um, yeah, we can, like we can third. review a couple more of these, and if that's the answer, is just to go through and say continue to do a straight formula, we can do the straight formula. Um, so as we said, this one here would have required, we already knew it was a little bit um, deficient because it came out at 1,600. Um, and they're going to need roughly 5,000. So according to that, they would need 34 new large trees to meet the standard for this. Um, and then and with, and with the draft version here, how many did you say? To meet to I think they were going to need five more. Yeah, that was close. What? What if the factor was just modified somewhat for larger parcels? Maybe one acre is not the tipping point, uh, but we still had some factor rather than a specific defined square footage the way it's written in the proposal. That does seem, it just seems somewhat arbitrary. And yeah, we can make it, um, it's, it's, a little bit complex, but I can I, I can see how it would work in my in my head that you could have a factor that's like if it's more than an acre, then it's this number, and then we're just using a slightly different factor that goes and says you know we're, we've got a kind of a steep factor you know think of it as your tax code you've got the the low you've got the eighteen percent and it just keeps stepping up as you're going along this this would be kind of working the other direction you've got a very high requirement that kind of steps down a little bit because once you get to these large parcels, as we said, adding 34 trees um, starts to become. Seems like a lot. It can <coughs> seem like a, a lot, you know, in addition to the trees that they're already planting. I mean, they're already planting, you know, 160 shrubs and 20 trees. But we're talking about two acres of impervious surface as well. Yep. Yeah, 70, 78,000. Yep. 78,000. So it's almost 50% coverage. In a district that's allowed to have 80% coverage. So you think you could work up some modifying factor for larger parcels? If you, if you think that's a... Uh, direction to go. I mean, I can certainly see your point. Somebody, if we if we were to then double the double the size of the parcel and double the size of the building, they would still only have to have two thousand square feet, and that you know, so as, as things continue to get bigger, to you still yeah. parking lots on on big lots. Right, and and we're losing the effect of mitigating the impervious surface. Yeah, by although you still have to meet the. It's less of an impervious Although you still have to meet the parking trees requirement. still have to have the same yeah. amount of undeveloped land. Uh, land, but there's grassland as opposed to plantings. You know, maybe we'd rather see some higher level of plantings. But instead of based on the district with the maximum coverage, can it be based on actual coverage? Right. That's kind of what I'm so if it's, you could have 90% coverage, but you only did 50% coverage. And you don't need as many trees, something like yeah, the the Would factoring. The reason why the factoring is in there is because it it everything else um, or the the ninety percent is in there is because it's how things cancel out. So I don't have to go and ask how big is the parcel. Otherwise, you end up with a formula that says how big is the parcel and how much is this and how much is this, and you're multiplying three right. things in by doing it this way. You're just going to go and say I've already canceled everything out, and I can explain the math if somebody really wants to get into the math of how if you put it by the 90%, it actually cancels itself out and you don't have to worry about what's your parcel size and multiplying anything else. I think we do want to get into the math. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> well, I, I think there's a concern that, I mean, so first I just want to say this is great work. Mm -hmm. We should just stop back and recognize yeah. that because you've yeah. basically mm -hmm. written a whole section. Oh. Um, so what we're doing is we're getting nitpicky now about one aspect of it, which is an important aspect, sure. Um, but the reason why I'm hearing a lot of concern is because we don't want to be recommending a policy that could be viewed as arbitrary um, or one that's encouraging a lot of 
Oh, yeah, months. absolutely. So, no, I think I think John, uh, John's comments were, were on point that certainly because if we cap it and just flat out cap it, then that becomes an issue. Um, so, but I do think. Go ahead. It's kind of a discreet question. Hopefully, it's a discreet question. I, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm, I don't understand a lot of this stuff to begin with. So I apologize if this is a I don't understand why the district coverage is a necessary variable in determining how much planting we need to do. Um, why, why can't we just use. I think that's the same question that everyone's trying yeah, to ask I, in different ways. Yeah, yeah, and so the the issue that I'm hearing is why does the default coverage, the maximum coverage allowed, cancel out, you know, the variables of what the lot size is and what the coverage being proposed actually is? You know, why why don't we use that as the calculation? And that's why getting into the math I think is needed. Well, yeah, I mean the reason why I'm asking about why the district maximum coverage is why that's necessary is because all of these factors are couched against that. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it'll allow for the, the, the maximum coverage of the district basically will determine what the likely available open space is. So if you were to have a factor of 0.1 in a 90% district, you'd end up in a situation where you'd have to cover everything with planting. Couldn't. Or yeah. potentially, so, right. or potentially, not be able to build because you need to take out building in order to plant your required landscaping. So it's the minimum available space. So yeah. th this is saying, I think if you do the math, it works out to basically thirty percent of your required open space is going to have to be planted in every district. Yeah. So what we're looking at is, if if you had a parcel and we pushed all the impervious cover, all the buildings and all the parking lots up front, and we put it all in back, we'd have so 20 percent of the parcel has to be left open. John, your explanation is okay. So that makes sense. Now the question is, how much of this 20 percent did we have to? That's, that's, yeah, that's yep. really so what, so what's okay. It's helpful for me. The percent for the lower ones is is about 30 percent. Okay. So what we said was of the remaining 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, okay. a third of it will be set aside as landscaped um, and managed. Now, the other issue that comes up, not to get everyone to in the weeds, is your setbacks automatically start to take out. So this is just taking your required setbacks. So you end up with these five foot that become difficult to plant trees in. So sometimes you're going to have landscaping that you, you're, you're required to keep five feet green on the outside. Well, you can the count the street, tre street trees along you there. You could count know. the street trees in the front, and you can count some of the stuff in the back. So some of the stuff is automatically covered for in your setbacks. So but you might not be able to plant a tree in your setback if there's just not enough room or if there's a shared driveway or if there's something... So if you can't meet these, you can talk to the DRB. And it, if you can't meet those, you can talk to the DRB. But that's why some of this, I said, we can't say 100% of your impervious. We, we couldn't do 100% because in a lot of cases you can't actually plant. You, you have to have some lawn somewhere that's just lawn or... So that was why we, we picked 30% just as a number to start with because we wanted to go and say, Let's pick 30%. Let's run a couple of models, see if it works. Kind of worked at 30%. So that's why we kind of kept it. And then when we ran it on different size parcels, that was where we started to see some discrepancies that started coming in. Whether it's the, the four acre parcel here, or, and I've got some, some copies. I don't know if we all need to have a copy, but I, I made enough copies for people to grab. Thanks. Welcome to we have can one. share over here. Um, here, you can you can use that one, and we'll just share here, and they can share there. We'll walk um, us through it. So timber homes is a nine acre in the rural district. So it's um, you know on the second page. This was their landscaping plan. Um, that they put together. 
which included 10 to 13 more trees, 75 shrubs. Uh, it's in the rural district. Anyone who's driven up Route 12 can see the new building that was going in. So, my notes that I put together in this one. So this is this only has a requirement for 20 percent. Maximum impervious coverage is 20 percent. Um, and it wasn't even close, although it doesn't look like I wrote down. Wonder if the 4356 was the. Um, but the the requirements for the trees that were on. 4356 is based on the all other districts. Uh, 4356 is the all other districts. So that was the requirement. They would have to have 4,356. And that number is artificially low because it's a nine acre site. But um, how much impervious is there? It had, and that was what I was looking for. Was what are we looking at here? Orange. I don't think I grabbed the number for the impervious cover on this one because it was over an acre in size. Because the parcel is more than an acre in size, so maybe that actually would be an interesting number to to look up. Try to remember off the top of my head what was. Uh, is was there a legend that came with this? Oh, there's a. This is this is two pieces of a much larger. Okay. Document. So the impervious that we're looking at is the building, the driveway, and then what is the orange? The orange is another. That's the three houses. So it's another set of impervious, including the three houses proposed. Proposed. Uh, it's it's actually already approved. It just hasn't been constructed yet. But that's a oh. part of the same. Owner. It's part of the same parcel, so it would have mm -hmm. to be counted. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I'd have to get all of the impervious if we wanted to go and kind of look at what the total impervious on this one would be to multiply it out. I didn't write it down on my list because it was more than an acre, so I wouldn't need the number. Um, so in this case, if you added up all the trees they were doing, it's 1,176 square feet of materials. They have a requirement for 4,356. So in this case, they would be well short. But what's not, what is now can be taken into account is the natural square footage of natural coverage, which along the shore, there. Um, there is about 5,000 square feet of natural coverage. That's not indicated here. That's not indicated here. But if we had this as a rule, we would have required them to go to, uh, map that out, which you get a two to one, so they would have gotten credit for 2,500. Still, so still short. Still short. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't think in this case, if we were looking at this, this is a huge open site. If we were to require them to have put in some additional large trees, I don't think it would have hurt the proposal. Are you assuming that the ones that are specified are large trees? Uh, I assumed those were medium trees. Yeah, because they were apples. Because they were yeah. apples. But again, I guess once this goes in, then you would ask that people on their plant schedule indicate. Yeah, yeah we would have the, to determine. And we would also then also require um, on their site plan what are the planting areas. In this case, they're pretty well spaced out. So chances are good they could just go through and, and get a uniform circle that would go through and say, as long as there's no tree within this circle, I've got a rooting area that's sufficient. Right, yeah. But then they also need to at least give you a calculation of the impervious. Yes, and I, I, I do have that. Okay. It's just I didn't write it down on my cheat sheet. No, but they, they gave it to you or you had They to gave it to okay. me. They had to for impervious okay. cover requirements. So it's, it is written in the... So can document. you give us some comparison of what the proposed version would look like compared with just using J2 for the entire thing? Uh, if, you, if you just use the factor under J2. Yeah, if I could have, yeah, if I knew the impervious cover, so let me, if that other one was, how big is that building? Oh, it's two. I want to say it was a 5,000 square foot building, wasn't it? Five, let's, I mean, if we called that, let's call this another 80,000 square feet. If, if it were right around 80,000 square feet of impervious cover between all of these buildings. That's a lot. 
times what's our requirement for that district? They're multiplied times 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 equals 8,000, which is divided by 100 would be 80 large trees that would need to be added. Um, they already have some. What is this? So that doubles the requirement under three. That's if we use two, if we use the multipliers under These two. Homes? Well, and it's a what, are, what is this? Oh, what is that? <laughs> the orange. These are yeah. Um, these are homes, but including all the all the roads and everything. In the building, so all of a, this. It's a production facility, right? Yeah, that's timber that's timber homes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, it's it's timber homes is for okay. constructing timber. I didn't know buildings. if they were homes or if they were <laughs> no, 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 the no. These, where this is timber homes. frames where they're going to build timber frame Got homes it. and now here's where they're building where people live. It makes more sense. Yeah. yeah. And are these other rectangles that are dark which is not are very those well impervious? Those are the stacks. Just stacks. So that's not impervious. Okay. More or less. Yeah. <laughs> Wood yeah. Well, they're elevated. Up. Yeah, they're elevated oh, they're off elevated. the ground. Okay. Yeah, they have to be because they're, right. they're so we're bundled. Right, so allowing that there be yeah. Um, okay, yeah, underneath it. So, are we making any headway on this? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was this. Th these were some of the things cold. that we ran into when we when we started to run some numbers. As we start thinking, you know, is it appropriate that these guys would be required to have 80 more trees, or 75 more trees? Total. 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 They would have to build 70. They would have to plant 75 trees in order to get a permit to build that. facility there so and right now they are proposing how many? uh they had to uh 10 to 13 new trees and 75 new shrubs so but the isn't the reality for these large rural sites is that they'll likely just meet the percentage based on the existing vegetation and it'll all be driven by meeting whatever uh, subdivision or site plan standards that are asking them to screen or like design oriented stuff yeah, as opposed to doing the math. This is probably more of a unique of trees there, right? This is probably more of a unique site in that it's nine acres and it is almost devoid of any trees. Mm -hmm. oh, which is which is in which is in character with being along the river though. Yeah. I guess so, but yeah with it. So this is a prime example where a waiver might make sense. I think, yeah, it smells like a waiver, yeah. Yeah, as opposed to probably the other side of the road where 90% of the similar sized lot yeah. is trees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're going to meet their requirement by simply stating that we yeah. meet our requirement because we. So what did you, I didn't understand what you said. You said they'll be meeting a different standard because of. If you have a large lot in a rural area, odds are you're going to meet whatever percent we come up with with the trees that are already oh, with the existing. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. you get Just half the value. Right? Yeah. You get half the value, but you're still... Half the value in square footage of this existing? This is just a unique yeah. site right. that happens to be large rural, but not have a lot of trees. Okay. Do we want to credit the existing with more than just half? Is there a reason behind that? Is it just existing? Is it specifically forest, then, not just not existing? Or just existing green coverage? So that as for what's the requirement right no, now? No, how is, how is it decided that half of a, the existing coverage would be allowed, would be counted? I just, um, is there I just made up the number. I don't know if there was some standard. There, there was, there was no standard, and it was actually a question that has come up in actual applications. People have come in to go through and say, hey, I'm, I'm building right up here on, on River Street, but my lot actually is, backs up, and I actually have another two acres of trees behind me, so I don't need to meet any of your landscaping requirements. Technically, as the zoning is written right now, yes. Um, at least now, we're factoring it in at two to one. We don't oh, want to I penalize it too much. Right. Okay. We don't want to penalize it too much because we don't want to incentivize people to actually start to cut, cut down, down the natural trees. trees. Yeah. We actually want to give them a, a certain Benefit, but it we're, seems like it should be more of like a qualitative issue than, than a quantitative one. For yes, here, which is why you have four requirements. We you still have this. You still have to meet the street tree requirements. You still have to meet the parking lot requirements. So even if you only had to plant three trees, but you have a parking lot that requires you to plant seven, you have to plant seven. Yeah, 
Yeah. Right. And you automatically are way past your total landscaping requirement that you have to meet mm -hmm. because you had to plant street trees and you had to plant parking lot trees or you had to plant screening mm -hmm. and you may already be above and beyond your total landscaping before you get there. The total landscaping is your is your catch at the end that goes and says you didn't have to meet this, you didn't have to meet this, you didn't have to meet this, but every project should have some landscaping. And we're going to require you to meet this minimum amount of landscaping and you know, this project is a perfect example of that. You don't have any other requirements in here. You don't have to meet street trees. Um, you do have to meet the parking lot. Shading. Yeah. Shading. But. And some screening, but it's. Some screening, but you're kind of tucked away. Yeah. Not a lot that you have to. Not on the streets. So, so um, I know we're running out of time. I, I don't think we're going to get but, there tonight. Uh, I wish we could, but I don't think we're going to. So what I think makes sense for this section for next time, um, Mike, would you mind reaching out to John Snell again and, and talking to him about our concerns about referencing standards that haven't been adopted? Um, I'm happy to do it if you would prefer. No, nope, I can I can do that. Um, it's not that we don't want to include standards. We just don't want to reference ones that aren't in place already. Yeah, we're. I, I should at least give them a heads up that we're probably not going to have a requirement in there for them until they adopt them. And if they're interested in moving forward on adopting some standards or recommending some standards for us to adopt into the. Yep. Either way works. We I can think. do it. And I think actually that was the preference, was that to adopt the written standards into. Yeah. If we're if, if we're referring to the best management practices of this company, then let's state that in here, because then there's a public process that goes along with the adoption. Right. Right. Exactly. Is there a requirement to use as much printer ink as possible? <laughs> <laughs> First, I thought that was the proposal. Kind of a green field. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's what it was. <laughs> and then, um, would you like me to try to come up with a, a, a in a an adjusted factor for number three, maybe? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other than that, does it seem like we're generally... Well, the adjusted factor for number three, and then uh, uh, see if see if you can come up with any sort of way to change the metric for um, counting what's already there. Meaning? I, I mean, so the, the, tree, the existing trees, mm -hmm. sort of giving them a oh. discounted rate. I think it's only for forest land, though, right? That was my understanding. Forest so if there's land. like a big oak tree right next to your house. That's different than yeah, a, a tree. Yeah, forest. an individual tree that's okay. next to your house, we would count as uh, in the same way that so um, that gets okay. You okay. don't want to like forest have land. someone cut it down. And yeah. Put up two trees. Yeah. 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 In the same way that this is the Elm Street project. Elm Street's right here. Yeah. And if you happen to know this this property, it has two prominent um, trees in the front yard very large trees mm -hmm. and you know th this was where the joke came in b before that we were talking about the fact that technically the owner of this parcel would have to cut down one of these giant trees mm. to plant more shrubs because he met his tree requirement he wasn't meeting his shrub requirement mm -hmm. and so we were like well that's just silly to have rules that would tell us to cut down these two street trees can you flip it over i want to see it there oh see the picture yeah that's the um this is the front of the house so it's got a porch on the front Oh, yeah, trees. okay. Yep. The proposal in this case was actually in back to convert the abandoned shed into mm -hmm. two new housing units. Yeah. Shillings used to live. Mm -hmm. so, so that was, as I said, that was a little bit of... So you get full credit for those. You would yeah. get full credit. What these guys yeah. would be able to do would, would be to come through and count count the number of trees when we go through and say... You need to have seven, or you need to have so many square feet, they can say, I got one, two, three, four, five trees. You know, we can determine whether these are viable trees based on, you mm. know, because obviously okay. if you count them, you can't cut them down. Okay, okay. Right. All so right. To save the trees. Yes. It is so we'll take trees. that up at our next meeting, which is December 10th. Um, we're going to skip over item six. Sorry, Barb. We'll get to that at That's December right. 10th. Um, Let's quickly go over the minutes from October 22nd, just as a final thing, so we can get these posted. Um, 
Do I have a motion to? A, oh, we have to. Uh, we have to it. fix the, the May due date <laughs> for Stephanie. I'm doing early March. <laughs> oh. Oh. Because it made the minutes. That's, uh, it's not just a silver. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Future generations. Oh yes. Is this is some sort of. Okay. I'm not thinking on that. Since it happens to be in there, it should probably be right. <laughs> early March, yeah. Early March, yeah. Um, Aaron's name is misspelled too. That's okay. It's Phonetic. Well, it's correct on the um, flag. Oh, yes, it is. So just, just for her benefit, it is K-I-S-I-C-K-I. Easy, right? So K-I-S-I-C-K-I. Because she, she writes the minutes based on the video. So. Okay, I move approval of the minutes as corrected. Okay. I'll second. All those in for any well any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? None. Motion carries. Do I have a final motion for adjournment? Do I have a second? Yes. Non debatable. So anyone? <laughs> okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you. See you December tenth.